Good evening, everybody. Uh, we are here tonight for an unusual but important meeting of the council as a committee of the whole to hear uh, to at, both hear a, a brief presentation from the administration regarding uh, Metro's uh, uh, transit initiative, mayor's transit initiative. Um, then we'll open it up for questions. I do know that at seven o'clock at another location, there is another council uh, called meeting, which many will want to go to. So and what I hope will be a, a not too brutal fashion, I intend to move us through this with, uh, with some speed. Um, in that in in that in that vein, I will um, recognize council members uh, for five minutes each initially, and then if you have more questions, you'll be allowed to come back and go through a second round. So, if you want to make a five-minute speech, we're all going to sit here and listen. If you got five minutes of questions, we'll be here for those two. So, with that, um, Mr. Rieblin. Thank you, Vice Mayor, members of council. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my role is to really just provide some brief introductions, uh, and then turn it over to the speak to the to speakers who are going to go through the very brief PowerPoint presentation. And then I want to introduce the other people that are up here That's in the front of the room who will be able to uh, assist you in answering questions. Uh, our role, I can either guide the questions to the right party or feel free to ask the, anybody up here if you, you know them specifically and who you want to address the questions to. So we're going to start the presentation with uh, Steve Bland, obviously our CEO, CEO of the MTA, uh, and then uh, he's going to turn over for brief comments from Tracy Thomas, who is a partner with Kraft Brothers. Kraft Brothers was the firm that was selected to provide the independent CPA review, which was required under the Improve Act. Uh, and then Ashford, Ashford Hughes in the mayor's office will close the presentation, uh, talking briefly on issues, diversity, workforce, and affordability, uh, and comment on some of the work that the task force recently worked on. Uh, and so after that, then after that, when it's open to questions, uh, sort of the people up in the front of the room who are available, I want to introduce are G Jim Zarnicki and, and Butch Ely with HDR. Uh, that firm is served as the, uh, the kind of taking the lead on the development of the, uh, of the transit improvement program. Uh, also, obviously, Mark Sturdivant from Public Works is up here as well, up there as well. Uh, also on the, on the left side is Ed Gangler with Goldman Sachs. Raise your hand. Goldman Sachs has provided the uh, financial, sort of did the financial modeling uh, for the plan and is available to, to really handle any of the financial questions that you have associated with the plan. Over on my right, we have the co-chairs of the Transit and Affordability Task Force, people who need no introduction, but I will introduce former Mayor Bill Purcell and our own county clerk, Brenda Wynn. Appreciate the work that they did in guiding the task force. Uh, and then finally, for MBE workforce development, uh, and procurement issues, um, we have Dr. Beverly Scott in the corner. Beverly uh, is, is nationally known and involved in, in workforce development across the country on similar type projects. Obviously, Ashford and then Roxanne Bethune, who many of you know, Roxanne has worked as a consultant for many projects around Nashville uh, to, to increase workforce development and minority participation, uh, and she can talk about experience uh, and, and what we want to do on these projects going forward. Uh, finally, we have obviously Kim McDaniel from Finance Department to represent the Finance Department. And then last, uh, Garrett Harper with the Nashville Chamber, if you have some specific questions on uh, the financial, uh, some of the economic analysis of the project. So those are the, that's the table that we have for you. Uh, we think that that group can answer, uh, and hopefully can answer every question that you might have. And obviously, uh, if we don't have the answers, we'll get them to you shortly. So with that, Steve, it's your show. Thank you, Mr. Reveling. Thank you, members. Uh, Vice Mayor Briley, uh, we all appreciate the opportunity to be here to address your questions tonight. Again, I want to emphasize the fact this will be a very brief presentation. I've, I've spoken individually to pretty much everyone in the room and in group to you several times, so you've kind of walked with us through this process really over the last two, three years. Uh, but where we are today in terms of this specific ordinance and this specific legislation, first of all, a little bit of the history. You all remember that when Nashville updated its comprehensive plan, Nashville Next, several of the key principles were to begin to, with the expansive growth that the city's experiencing, focusing more of that growth into some of our key corridors and our key activity centers. And that map may look very familiar 
to you, and that was a, a preference voiced by literally thousands of Nashvillians all over the county in order to preserve quality of life, to preserve our open space, to enhance some of our neighborhood settings. Not long after, uh, actually not even at the conclusion of Nashville Next, but as it was wrapping up, the Metropolitan Transit Authority and the Regional Transportation Authority of Middle Tennessee, which serves the 10 county greater Nashville region, co-kicked off the End Motion process, which was a strategic transit plan. Specifically for Davidson County, the intent was to build off the work and the conclusions of Nashville Next to see what type of mass transit and broader mobility system should work into that envelope. And over the period of about 14 months, uh, we did a whole lot of technical analysis and alternative scenario development. But I think most important, following uh, on the footsteps of Nashville Next was a real focus on broad community engagement, uh, both in terms of numbers, but also trying to work with broad and diverse community sectors to get very specific requirements that people had of a system. Through that period, we were able to do uh, over 20,000 in individual engagements. An engagement might be you attended a meeting, or you submitted a survey, or you participated in social media. And of course, parallel to that, the business community, kind of launched by the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce, initiated their moving forward process to further engage businesses and citizens in the development of a comprehensive mobility solution. This gives you a broad overview of the timeline of where we are now. We'll talk a little bit about the IMPROVE Act, which enables the ordinance that you will be taking up um, through the course of the next month or so. Uh, first of all, is a requirement of the strategic plan, and the Let's Move Nashville plan is Davidson County's, uh, or I'm sorry, the, um, yeah, the, the Let's Move Nashville is Davidson County's plan, um, tying on to the end motion process. So make no mistake, in terms of regional participation, Let's Move Nashville is integrally tied to what was developed in end motion. Uh, a feasibility assessment was conducted in some of the high investment corridors, specifically where light rail, rapid bus was contemplated to say, well, is such a thing physically possible? And using engineering services, not a full-blown design study, not a full-blown alternatives analysis, but essentially what was identified is, yeah, there are some tight squeezes, there are some issues we'll need to deal with on a neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood basis. Technically, it's feasible, and the issues we'll run into are not significantly different than what other cities and other communities have done. Part number three, where we are now, is the public engagement and council consideration process. Um, I have a slide a bit later on the public engagement specific to Let's Move Nashville. And of course, uh, on your schedule is to take up the full ordinance for adoption. May 1st would be the date of the referendum. And uh, if the referendum passes, several things happen. First of all, in terms of some of the longer term projects, we move into what we're referring to as a pre-design process. So make no mistake, and I know a number of us, us have had this conversation with many of you individually, the vote that you may take in early February is not the last touch uh, that council gets on any of this material. Pre-design really means we go into those specific projects and do corridor studies, um, those types of analyses, specific design. Parallel to that are the shorter term service improvements. Um, significant expansion in bus hours, improvements in bus frequency on dozens of routes, creation of the frequent transit network on about 14 of our corridors, um, expansion in access ride and overall improvements in access ride service, mobility on demand services, new crosstown routes, all of those initiate literally, if the vote passes in May, you will start to see visible improvements in the system in the form of expanded bus service by September of 2018. Following pre-design and um, neighborhood participation in those designs is actual design and then obviously into construction and commissioning. Quick review of some of the Improve Act provisions that the state adopted last year. First of all, to be considered to be put on a, on a ballot for local dedicated funding, transit, Im transit improvement program must be developed and published. That is what the Let's Move Nashville plan is. It is the transit improvement program uh, in compliance and full compliance with the Improve Act. Coordination is required to occur with uh, other local and regional governments. 
Um, I see Michael Skipper here from GNRC, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, GNRC, the Regional Transportation Authority, the Mayor's Caucus of Middle Tennessee have all been instrumental in this, and all of those groups have participated in understanding what the Let's Move Nashville plan is. And in certain cases where projects might interface with other counties, for instance, uh, improvements on the Music City Star, uh, specific conversations have been held with those effect affected counties. Soliciting public comment, we had about 11 <coughs> community meetings, and I'll touch on those in a moment, uh, is required by the Act. The Act also details the approved sur surcharge options that are available to the Council uh, and the City as a whole. And then finally, before anything can go on the uh, ballot, obviously, as you're aware, the legislative body for the county jurisdiction must approve it to go on to the ballot. In quick sum, um, there's obviously a huge amount of detail in the written report. Quick summary of the, of the Let's Move Nashville plan. More buses more often, uh, literally about a 50%, about a 41% increase in service hours, 50% increase in fleet, significant expansion in our span of bus service, uh, major improvements to frequency on a number of routes, expanded bus shelters, uh, expanded um, pedestrian facilities surrounding those shelters. Number two is obviously light rail, which has garnered uh, a significant amount of attention, as it generally does uh, when it's introduced in a community. More sidewalks, uh, millions and millions of dollars committed to sidewalks and pedestrian um, and other, what I'll call other mobility improvements that are both related to and separate from these specific infrastructure projects, including uh, what we what we underthink of when we think about pedestrian activity and sidewalks is improved crossings and safer crossings. A network of 19 neighborhood transit centers, places where multiple bus routes or um, a rail line or car share or bike share or ride share can come together, some with park and ride capabilities, to serve as sort of a neighborhood connecting point to a broader regional system. Um, the downtown circulation solution, again, um, one that's garnered quite a bit of attention, a tunnel from the north end of downtown to the south end of downtown to help relieve what is currently intense congestion and what is only projected to get more so uh, over the next few years. And then finally, improved commuter rail, specifically on the Music City Star, more trips, more frequent service. Implementation timeline, you see, we would anticipate um, beginning the, the implementation of the frequent transit network in 2018, building that through, through increased service hours, ordering the vehicles we need to improve frequency to kick that off in 2019, starting the infrastructure improvements for rapid bus corridors and kicking off those corridors by 2023, and then starting to see light rail come online 2026 through 2032. Um, and again, there are dozens of other service enhancements that occur throughout. In terms of our public engagement interview, this does not include work that had been done on efforts like Nashville Next, the in motion process. This is specific to Let's Move Nashville um, during that fairly brief uh, period of time just before the close of the year. We had 11 neighborhood open houses throughout the county. We had about 735 total folks attend, 74 total comment. Uh, cards that were turned in. On our website, 13, over 13,000 unique users, 121 additional comments, 13,000 views of the video that was produced, and over 50,000 views of the web page. Kicking over real quickly to the financing plan that I know most of you have paid fairly close attention to, and again, remembering that um, Metro's options are limited to what is authorized by the state. The proposed surcharges are on the general use sales tax, one half percent going into effect during 2018, bouncing up to 1% in 2023. On our business tax, a 20% surcharge on the existing business tax, not a 20% business tax, a 20% um, increase in that current um, level. Hotel tax to go to a one quarter percent surcharge upon implementation, and then moving to three-eighths in 2023. And then finally, similar to the business tax, a 20% um, surcharge on top of the existing um, rental car tax. As part of the IMPROVE Act requirements, in collaboration with the Co State Comptroller's Office, 
There was a requirement to select an independent certified public accounting firm to conduct an examination of the plan of finance. And uh, now stepping up will be Tracy Thomas from Kraft CPAs that conducted that examination. <coughs> Thank you. As required under the Improved Act, an independent accounting firm was required to perform an attestation or looking at the assumptions. And uh, the type of uh, attestation engagement we performed was an examination, uh, which is conducted under attestation standard number 205. Uh, in performing this examination, we looked at the uh, underlying assumptions relating to the financing plan as well as the uh, underlying calculations and uh, uh, and assertions. Uh, for example, as we saw in the previous slide, the uh, financing plan surcharges, uh, one of the tests that we performed was looking at the base uh, revenue amounts and then performing on a go forward basis the uh, uh, calculations to determine whether the. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll start all over. Okay, uh, as part of the uh, requirements under the IMPROVE Act, um, there's a requirement for an independent accounting firm to uh, determine the uh, feasibility of the, of the uh, financing plan, to uh, take a look at the uh, assertions, and as part of that uh, uh, engagement, we performed an examination of assertions that was conducted under attestation standard number 205. Uh, in preparing this examination, we looked at the underlying assumptions and calculations uh, supporting the assertion. Uh, for example, as you saw in the previous slide, the financing plan surcharges, we uh, recalculated those based on the uh, 2017 base year revenues and then on a go forward basis, looked at the uh, uh, anticipated rates of growth and to recalculate, recalculate those and also to look at uh, a reasonability of those calculations. Good evening, council members. Can you hear me? We recognize that this plan is the largest economic stimulus package in the, the history of Nashville. We also recognize this plan to be the largest job creator in the history of Nashville as well. And that's why the mayor has committed to full inclusion and participation of DBEs, that is disadvantaged business enterprises. Uh, what we have been working on is learning from our, our past projects and successes from our last past projects in Nashville, such as the Music City Center, such as Extend Amphitheater, as well as the Omni Hotel. But we, are, we have also been looking at what other cities have been doing to be successful in DBE and minority business participation as well. And that's why we are setting out to develop the most significant DBE effort in the history of Metro. The mayor has also been aggressive in targeting 30% disadvantaged business participation, which includes a focused and intentional target on minority business enterprises. I think it's important to hear that. The mayor has been aggressive in targeting 30% diverse business participation. The way we hope to address this is to provide adequate staffing to support this effort, including a project team with a dedicated team leader focused on diverse business participation and workforce development. We know that we want to begin now on this process of building up the capacity within our DBEs and our minority businesses for not only this project at hand, but the other projects that will come online in between as well. Beginning in November, uh, the mayor convened a, a group of stakeholders around 20 individuals to really look at uh, transit and affordability around transit projects. Uh, that effort was led by our mayor, former mayor Bill Purcell and our county clerk, Mrs. Brenda Wynn. Uh, through those convenings and through those meetings, they concluded there were three really key recommendations that they wanted this plan to have. The first recommendation revolved around community outreach and engagement. There should be an extensive engagement strategy well before the installation to each high capacity corridor. That was very important to the committee. Number two, 
transit-oriented development guidance, the task force recommended that there be a fixed, firm housing targets and an annual scorecard to evaluate the goals identified. Finally, funding. Throughout each subcommittee of the task force, each recommended a dedicated funding source for both small business mitigation and creation of affordable housing development and preservation. Benefits of all Nashvilles, all Nashvilleans. As I've talked about this being the, the largest economic stimulus in the history of Nashville, we know that residents in Nashville, individuals, we like convenience. This plan here allows 76% of residents to live within a convenient access to the lines. 89% of jobs will be convenient and have access to those lines as well. We look at the economic impact of this plan moving forward. 4.76 billion GDP growth. Importantly, when we look at 3.66 billion in labor income, that means the individuals that live in your districts will have more money to take their family out to movies, to the extra dinner that night a week. That is very important, 3.66 billion in labor income. We talk about jobs created per year, close to 3,900 good paying jobs in this community per year via this plan. I'll turn it back over to Rich. My role is to sort of help direct questions. Hopefully I'm not needed. If you feel free to ask directly anyone up here, but if it's a general question, I might guide it to uh, who I think is the appropriate, uh, best person to answer for your question. So with that, Vice Mayor, we're ready to, to entertain. Go ahead and hit your buttons. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna go down the line. Council Lady Wiener. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Rich, and everybody else for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to ask some questions of Garrett Harper, if he is here. Great. Um, when you arrived at the percentage of income that was spent on taxes, did you use an existing model? And if so, could you briefly explain that? Yes, thank you, Council Lady. Um, for the study, we adhered to the model that was a part of work that's been done by the District of Columbia Department of Finance since 1997. They've released an annual report that examines the total tax burden of households at different ranges in the largest city of each state uh, across the country. Uh, this model has been widely accepted and recognized by municipalities, organizations working in this field and we uh, largely used that model and then were able to make these assumptions around changes in the tax rates within what was a very transparent methodology that they include in the report each year. Thank you. So additionally in the analysis, um, even with the tax increase, Nashvilleans' average annual tax burden is still less than in Memphis by anywhere from 350 to roughly $1,221 in all brackets 50000 and above. For those that fall below that, and I'm thinking in the $25,000 bracket, the Nashville tax is actually higher than Memphis by $150 a year for those folks. So the proposal to give them free transit passes, and if you can't answer this one, Rich, point me to who can, um, maybe Aaron or somebody, but the proposal to give the free transit passes to households earning at or below the 100% of the area median income what would be the average value to that family, say it's two adults, similar to the study, two adults and a child, if they were to use that transit every day, what's that give or take for them? Sure, currently if you, if you procure a, a monthly pass, for instance, about $45 per month per individual. So a household, let's assume it's two wage earners and maybe two children who meet the uh, age requirement. Um, you're talking about savings in order of magnitude, 120 to 150 dollars per month. Thank you. And obviously, um, pure savings. It depends on use, how frequently you'd use the system. Okay, great. Thank you. And then um, it also reveals, back to Mr. Harper, it reveals if I make 50 thousand dollars a year, my average taxes, if I'm trying to look at it per day, because those of us that really penny pinch like me look at it per day. Um, I happen to know what my ta sales tax payments are every year. And in 2017, mine was actually lower 
than what you had represented, so I felt pretty comfortable with the report. But having said that, my taxes are going to move if I make 50000 a year from $9.07 to $9.56 a day, and if I make $100,000 a year, my taxes would move from $16 to 1750 a day. Is that about right? Um, it is correct that they, for instance, at the 50000 level, would move up by about $0.49 cents a day. Uh, the, the total calculation is into uh, the uh, sales tax portion of that uh, rather than the, the full amount. So right. out of the approximately 3000 paid in total tax burden, only a portion of that would be the sales tax. Um, okay, thank you. And then um, you provide a list of the cities that you use in comparison from the report. Can you share what other factors beyond Tennessee not having an income tax factored into potentially what those differences are since we're below the median? Right, right. Uh, certainly that's a, a major contributory factor, the lack of a state income tax, also the absence of a local payroll tax, as well as property values being comparably lower in, in this area than some of those other parts of the country and how that's reflected in the tax uh, burden. Okay, thank you. And then this one, Rich, is probably for you or somebody in the administration. We have a $1.5 billion federal bucket of money. Can you share with us if that's for new or upgraded projects, A, and B, realistically, how much of that $1.5 billion do you think we'll really see? Yeah, um, the, the $1.5 billion is represented by um, the New Starts 5309 federal contribution. We uh, historically, the uh, Federal Transit Administration has funded projects um, going back 20 years or so at 80% federal contribution, 20% local match. More recently, that has been reduced to about a 50% or 49% federal match and a 50% local match. Um, given the uncertainty going forward, we were even more conservative to that uh, than that, and we assumed about a 25% federal contribution or federal match to the capital improvement uh, portion of the of the transit program. So the 1.5 billion represents the 25%. Yes, of of the new start uh, uh, capital investment contribution. Okay. Steve. Council Lady, an additional federal factor that's in is uh, what I'll call traditional formula-based funds that MTAs historically received, that a projection was done because it's based on hours and ridership would go up with the increasing size of the system. When you have an opportunity to come back to me, I have a Bellevue question. Do you just have one more question? Just one. Go. Okay. Um, as far as areas that light rail isn't designated for in the plans and other areas of the community, like Bellevue, are not identified in the plan. You knew I was going to go there, Rich. Um, why can I, exactly, um, when a constituent in my community says to me, why should I support this plan, what is your answer to them? Well, I would say to literally anyone who lives in Davidson County, there will be service, there will be general public service in this plan available to you in one way, shape, or form. Um, and while well, some of even the further out than Bellevue, because Bellevue will have direct fixed route service enhancements, fixed route bus service enhancements. But even if we were in the, what I'll call the more rural areas of the county, certainly expanded access ride, which is something that we hear a lot of call for. And then what we're referring to is a mobility on demand model, which kind of takes the access ride um, on demand model, whether that's either live via app or advanced reservation not specifically for senior citizen or person with disability. And I know um, we saw one of the questions, uh, the example of one of the neighborhoods where she were just on the other side of I-40 from Charlotte Avenue where expanded bus service and eventually light rail would go. So the idea of being able to get um, a ride at least partially underwritten to get to those stations. And then um, the particularly for Bellevue, the service enhancements, the number five West End Bellevue route is part of the frequent transit network. So extended service hours uh, and additional frequency on those lines, you know, among other improvements. Uh, and I really delved into, for instance, the neighborhood transit centers. Uh, there are a couple, of, there's one in Bellevue specifically, and then a couple um, kind of on the fringes of that area. Uh, and then other infrastructure improvements like the pedestrian improvements. And Rich, that includes Sawyer Brown, Old Hickory, some of those other areas. Okay, great. Thank you. Councilman John Cooper. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, appreciate everybody being here. Uh, uh, all the public is going to see on May 1st on the, rec on, the ref on the ballot is that 200 plus word description. Very well done, describes purpose, um, the taxes, the sources of money. But when it comes to the uses of money, it has a very s simple sentence. The capital cost of the program is estimated to have a present day value of $5.34 billion. Now, I, I worry that our citizens are going to find that um, confusing and misleading because the, the total amount of money, as we know, looking at the very fine 55-page summary, is really $8.962 billion. And so um, the actual capital budget number is $6.6 .6 billion, and there's $2.3 billion in, a, in additional spending. And then you're using, so you're using the word capital to only report capital and not total amount, and you're using present value to discount the $6.6 .6 billion down to $5.3 billion. Now, because there's $2.341 billion really not showing up on the ballot, isn't this something that should be reported? And aren't, aren't, isn't it some fundamentally misleading to have a number that large because it's still money too? We still have to spend it. It's a huge amount of money. Um, and to, you, you selected two words in that sentence, capital and present value, to come in with the, almost the lowest possible amount of money that could be reported out of something that, in fact, your documents very fairly show that it's $8.962 billion. So if we could just get a response to that. And can we amend the referendum language to be more accurate as to total cost? Well. <clears throat> I believe that the council has the right to amend the language if it chooses to. It's an ordinance, and the language is part of the ordinance. Uh, I think in talking with the legal director and staff, we feel that it is reflective and accurately describes the program. But obviously, uh, if uh, the council feels differently, then uh, subject to the word limit, and, uh, and that, I guess there could be some change. I'm, I'm grateful to that, and um, I'm grateful to that, and then. I'm looking for co-sponsors to that amendment coming up on Tuesday because I do think the citizens have every right to know the total cost is blank. The total cost is blank. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Withers. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, would, would appreciate information on two different topics. So however you decide, up, however y'all divide up my five minutes of time is great, but one is um, uh, we have a lot of constituents in the East Nashville area and some other parts of the county where actually we do have more sidewalks than some other parts of the county, but uh, nonetheless, we, we have a lot of gaps, including along transit corridors such as Dickerson and some of the other roads. So I have a lot of interest from some of my constituents who advocate on that issue to get more detail about what is included in this plan for additional sidewalks and bikeways in particular as our county has such a crisis of funding sidewalks and that's number one and number two if uh, the uh, if M Mr. Purcell or Ms. Wynn could just maybe provide a brief overview of what some of the recommendations might have been from the affordability piece we for a long time have looked at uh, encouraging more dense development along our transit quarters and our community plans and things of that nature. But at the same time, displacement is a real uh, concern even today without a light rail, but especially if that were to come into place. So just a, a, a minute or two of a summary of what some of those recommendations would be would be great. I know a very lengthy document's been published, but I'd love to hear more about that. Mike slide. In, in regard to the sidewalk question, um, we've been getting a lot of attention, as you know, uh, regarding that subject. And uh, in our capital cost estimates for the high capacity corridors, uh, specifically light rail corridors, we're estimating about uh, over 30 miles of new sidewalk. And in, in addition, either the rehabilitation or reuse of existing sidewalk along those corridors. Um, likewise, um, at, the, at the LRT stations, we have uh, lump sum 
uh, estimates for light rail stations that include sidewalk improvements, although we don't have that quantified separately, either, either in linear feet or in, in dollars, but there is additional money there for sidewalk improvements near uh, adjacent and, and around the stations. Um, in addition, we have uh, about 9.5 million a year, almost in discretionary money, um, and that could also be used for sidewalk improvements that may not even be adjacent to the high capacity corridors. It could be for intersection improvements, pedestrian bicycle improvements, et cetera. And then if maybe I could pass it off to Steve if you wanna discuss the sidewalk improvements near the uh, neighborhood transit centers. Graham, um, there is money budgeted for sidewalk and crossing and related pedestrian improvements associated with the rapid bus corridors, uh, particularly where there are gaps. And also for neighborhood transit centers, there's an assumption that sidewalk infrastructure would essentially connect those facilities to surrounding neighborhoods. And then finally, uh, we're currently partnering with Public Works as we do additional shelter installations on making sure that those sites are reachable. So on more of what I'll call a spot basis, as we do the shelter expansion program, you'll see sidewalk or related pedestrian improvements associated with each of those sites. Well, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the council, it's a special privilege for me to have the opportunity to answer a question from my councilman. It is so often the other way, and I am very pleased that on this occasion I have an opportunity to answer his question and also uh, to acknowledge the presence of Brenda Wynn, who will uh, add, and I would also specifically say that a member of this council, uh, council member at large, Bob Mendez, who is in the chamber, uh, is particularly qualified uh, to, I think, provide the additional detail. The document that we provided to the mayor and to the city yesterday is approximately 60 pages in length. I thought the, the slide with the three points uh, was uh, a, a very efficient presentation of the work of the task force and, and uniquely efficient, more efficient than I could have done, uh, nor do I in the time allotted uh, am I able to expand much, but let me focus specifically. On displacement, uh, that was very much in the mayor's mind at the time the task force was appointed, uh, and it is absolutely in every portion, in my opinion, uh, in all three subcommittees. The subcommittees were also focused not just on displacement of housing and individuals and families, but in addition on small business and encouraging uh, those displacements to be understood and protected against as well as uh, making specific recommendations uh, so that there are efforts made to increase density along the transit lines that both preserve what's there but also add value and opportunity uh, for individuals, families to remain in the neighborhoods where they are, in the neighborhoods where they want to be, uh, and in many cases then, uh, in addition, come into neighborhoods where they have long been unable uh, to enter as well. You'll find specific recommendations as to funding broadly and very specific recommendations as to TIF and the opportunities that will be presented uh, under the guidelines. The mayor responded to those uh, those recommendations and indeed reflecting, uh, and Councilman Syracuse, I note, is in the room, uh, she reflected directly on the experience he's having in Donaldson at this time and the fact that she believes the targets in Donaldson, though more aggressive, may be indeed what she would recommend ultimately. Okay. Mr. Rabel, uh, go ahead. If I might, just for a second, I'd like to, Councilman Cooper, Cooper if I can go back to your question, uh, Legal Director Cooper, it gets confusing as to uh, which John Cooper I'm talking to right now. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the question that you raised, and I, and I wanted to make sure I, I was right on this, and I, wasn't, I didn't have the information in front of me, but if you go to the Improve Act itself, the language that's spelled out in the Act, what it wants included on the ballot, it says specifically an estimate of the initial and recurring cost of the program. That's what it asked to be put in on the language. And I think in talking with, with Attorney Cooper, that's why we put what we had, because if you would, the rest of what's in that section that you, that you didn't add was we put the initial capital cost and we also included the annual operating cost of the $99.5 million, $99 million a year. So just to, to, uh, to, just to, uh, to finish the sentence, it seems to us that we, had, we did, we had attempted to do what the act asked us to provide, and that's why we put it in there. Uh, uh, if I may, Vice Mayor, I appreciate that. Um, I do think that all the costs should be included. I understand the initial allows you to do the present value, but then you also have to 
include the non-capital costs, which in this case are so material. So I would urge the administration to support well, the it, amendment. It, and it's in there, Councilman, $99.5 million a year oh, in annual for operating the, cost. For the total cost, not the annual operating loss and subsidy, the total cost of the, the plan, as your very wonderful detailed summary shows, to make it generally available to the public. The public, not all the public is going to be able to read the 55-page summary, but they will have the 200-plus page wor words in front of them. So again, I'd urge that I, I, I hope that we can reach the right descriptive language that is fair to the uh, understanding of the bill. Thank you. Councilman Shulman. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, so I asked some, some previous questions before in writing, uh, and I was trying to follow up on at least a couple of them. Obviously, the other counties are not at play. They're, they're at play, but they're not on the ballot at this point. Um, so my question had been if at some point in the future um, they tie in, whether it's up the I-24 corridor, whether they're coming from Clarksville, I-40, whatever. The question is um, those additional costs. And I'm looking at the information, and uh, that was you all were uh, great to prepare. And it basically says that generally the answer is if there is a tie-in, it's not going to it's not going to be borne by Davidson County. But I guess my question would be: I mean, let's say that in the future uh, we build a corridor up from I-24 from Murfreesboro that ties in. So, are, are we saying that we're not responsible for any of those costs at this point, or has there been a look at what those costs might be? Jim may be able to touch on more specifics in the estimating, but from what I'll call a conceptual level, council and maybe through illustration, um, there's no expectation that there, first of all, this ordinance would not obligate Davidson County to pay for any project that a ring county would decide to pursue. Now, a good example in the current program are the Music City Star improvements. The way that those were programmed was essentially there's a series of improvements to the infrastructure and the systems associated with a star that would be required to operate more <coughs> service. Some of those costs can be specific to Davidson County, so a track improvement within Davidson County versus a track improvement to Wilson County. Some are more systemic, things like positive train control or equipment, that type of thing. Uh, and then those were allocated based on a track mile basis. So in theory, if Wilson County decided we want to move forward, we also want to expand the star, um, yeah, there would be a Davidson County cost, but it would be Davidson County's piece, you know, of that puzzle. Um, another potential example is light rail going up the northwest corridor adjacent to Tennessee State. Long Range, Montgomery, and Cheatham counties have plans to develop commuter rail tying into that line. There could be a decision through some future collaboration not committed to this ballot or this ordinance, so it's not committed in this program, that Davidson County wants to pursue a program to take that line out further toward Bradley Parkway or into the Bordeaux uh, area if that were desirable at that time. Well, I guess I'm talking about something bigger, and that is uh, let's, let's just find this guy. We want to build a monorail from uh, Murfreesboro up to Nashville to deal with the traffic on I-24. Uh, the question is... That's obviously not in this plan. The question would be, what would happen in that case? That's not, I mean, that's going to tie Murfreesboro into Nashville. Who bears the brunt of that cost, and have we actually looked at that? I, I would suspect, based on the IMPROVE Act, if, say, Rutherford County were to pursue a transportation improvement program that said, we're going to do a monorail from uh, Murfreesboro to Nashville, in their program, they're going to have to identify how that's being paid for, if there were some subsequent agreement for cost sharing, but nothing that a voter in Rutherford County would vote for could commit a Davidson County okay. expense. All right, so let me switch real quickly to, um, uh, back to Council, Council Lady Wiener's point about the federal money. I guess the question would be, and I understand that you all took fairly conservative estimates, but if that doesn't happen, if the money doesn't come, uh, how do we deal with that? Is that an obligation that we have to pick up some other place? I mean, have we looked at the fact that, you know, it's not, we're not, it may not come, so so who is responsible after that? I, 
and, and I'll probably ask Ed to, to jump in here as well, but it, on the face, if the federal money does not materialize, um, you could either slow down the construction of the program or you could truncate the scope of the program as, as one step. Um, finding additional funding sources would be another. But as we had discussed earlier, the, the likelihood of federal funding based on historical values uh, for decades it's a fairly reasonable probability or fairly reasonable assumption that we would have some federal contribution for these types of infrastructure projects in the future. Okay. All right, so um, my last question, and this came up the other night, and I was just curious if we've looked at this. Somebody uh, who came to the public hearing talked about uh, the, uh, the food tax, uh, the sales tax on food. Have we looked at that? Um, and um, I think there was a valid point. I mean, so I know that the legislature has reduced it, but this is going to end up increasing it. Has there been any effort to try to figure out um, is there any other thing we can do to deal with that? Short, not short of legislative action. I mean, the food tax, the, the food tax, say, groceries are on the, the local option portion of the sales tax now, so it has to be collected on local options on the surcharge that would be added to it. Correct? Yes. So. Legislative action is the only way to do it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilor Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I, too, am concerned about the regional counties. I, I really would like to know where they stand. Uh, have they or have we even talked to them about some kind of financial commitment, and are they willing to have any cost-sharing in this plan? Not in this plan because it is a Davidson County only plan. I think as you, um, I believe you were here Tuesday night at the public hearing, you heard from uh, Mayor McMillan from Clarksville and uh, Mayor Bradley of Robertson County, uh, and they, they both said that they felt their communities were next in line and were interested in, in, in doing something in their communities, and I think the rest of the regional mayors are in the same boat. Steve works with them a lot closer than I do. But this is the way the law was set up. It's on a county by county basis. Uh, some, some states set it up regionally. Uh, in Tennessee, the Improve Act was set up on a county by county basis. So this, uh, this act uh, is only in Davidson County uh, and is only voted on by the Davidson County residents and therefore uh, is, is, is put on uh, the Davidson County residents. Uh, although I would add, as Mr. Harper has prepared in his, uh, uh, for the chamber, an analysis of it, of the sales tax that is collected in Davidson County, I believe I'm right, it's some 47% uh, comes from out-of-county residents. So a portion of the, a, a major portion of the cost of this is already, be, will be borne by non-Davidson County residents. Would that include tourists or? Tourists commuters who work here, who, who live in Wilson County, come to Nashville to work and spend money at restaurants, shops, things of that nature. Those are the analysis that, that, that the chamber did, Mr. Harper did. Okay. Um, what kind of ridership is uh, expected or projected for the uh, bus system? Bus system or the train? We do have a, yep. Jim, do you want to hit that? Sure. <clears throat> okay, so um, the, the bus system, we're looking at about um, 16 million annual boardings. I have some other detail here. Uh, the total system uh, trips in year 2040 annually is estimated to be about 35 million trips annually. Um, the bus system in 2015, I believe, was 35,000 trips. And per average per day, correct. And we're we're seeing that that will increase to about 115,000 per day in year 2040. So nearly quadruple. Uh, and and we did. Uh, let me add to that. Um, we we extracted the ridership number from the Federal Transit Administration's stops model. It's an industry standard used by the federal government to uh, predict future ridership, and and that's one. Uh, criteria for which you use to compete for federal contribution for the New Starts programs. And, and, and I appreciate the projections and forecasting and how we come to those numbers, but if we don't meet those numbers, what happens? Well, let me let me say this. You, you, one, you would adjust your service plan 
so you equilibrate your service plan to the demand. And as, as the ridership grows over time, you would increase the frequency and duration of service. Um, so you want to always maintain an efficient operating uh, budget and, and operation. We, we've seen uh, recently with the STOPS model that, that our peer cities have been under-projecting ridership as opposed to over-projecting ridership. So we think the numbers that we are seeing may be the lower end of what we would actually realize here in, in Nashville. So I'm, I have a few, a couple of more questions. So maybe you can just get this information to me because I would want to know what contributing factors you have to increasing the ridership the third thing I'd like to know is, uh, I'm not sure if our constituents really know what's in this plan. Many of them think that they'll be voting for better transportation. How are we going to educate and share the specifics of the plan to the constituents? The, and, and the last thing is really not a question. Well, I guess I got another question. I know that I believe Denver started their... Um, transit plan, the, the planning of it like in 2004. And um, I'm just wondering with this plan, will it be antiquated by the time it's complete being that we are so far behind uh, in coming up with the transportation plan? And, and the other comment I really wanted to make, I appreciate the minority inclusion and uh, workforce development and all of that but I want some of my constituents to be able to leave a legacy, not just go to the movies or be able to buy dinner, but I want them to be able to leave a legacy for their families. So I want to make sure that the inclusion is equal across the board. You can take some time to respond. Go ahead. I mean, we'll let it, questions have to end, but answers can go on. Yes, um, sure. Let me let me first respond to the the timeline of the program and the planning effort. Um, one with Nashville next and in motion, we've already accomplished a significant amount of planning uh, for the region, and that was the point of departure for creating the Davidson County program, which is which is represented in the uh, transit improvement program. Um, and, and let me let me say this about the the the. Davidson County plan, it's, it's conceived to be successful as a standalone Davidson County plan. We don't believe its success is dependent on extensions into other counties. We think that that would be a good thing to, to grow into in the future, but as a standalone Davidson County plan, we believe it will be very successful in service, servicing uh, Davidson County. How many commuters we have? Uh, daily commuters from the surrounding counties, I would imagine that would be a significant uh, data it, it, it to, is. To, to determine whether it needs to be a Davidson County plan or whether it should be a regional plan. And, and I'm not doubting the demand for, for commuters um, from Collar County into Davidson County. That, that demand is real. But as a starting point, as a Davidson County plan, we believe that it still would be successful. Um, until, or it would be even improved when we introduce uh, extensions out to the to the Keller counties as well. Thank, Thank you, Councilor Um Go ahead. The, the only thing I wanted to say on how is the public going to know about this this information? I mean, obviously, um, you know, I think all of us, the administration, the whole city government, is committed to meet with any groups, any time to, to give them the, the merits of the plan and the details of the plan. Uh, we're not, I mean, there's sort of a fine line between, you know, uh, soliciting votes for the campaign and, and providing information. And our job will be to provide the information and others will, will decide whether there'll be uh, an actual campaign wage to, uh, to either vote, urge people to support it or perhaps not to support it. I, I was just looking at the previous meetings, the outreach meetings that have been held, and I didn't see the specifics being shared, and uh, and I'm just concerned because I want people to know exactly what it is they're voting I agree. for. They, they should know what they're voting for, there's no question. And and the plan is now out there and presented, and, and I think it's now, it's, it's, you know, once the council, if the council votes to put it on the ballot, then it's in, you know, we now have something concrete to, to discuss, and there'll be a, a ample discussion of that. We're willing to understand what you're saying. Thank you. Councilman O'Connell. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Are we doing one question at a time, or should I ask? A you have couple? five minutes. All right, perfect. Uh, I'll, I'll see how far we get here. Uh, I'll start with this one. Uh, so yesterday we saw the release of the recommendations of the Transit and Affordability Task Force. Um, and I've, I've reviewed that uh, collection of recommendations, but the thing that is not clear to me is um, how do we know which of those get adopted and how will we measure their progress over the course of the project? I know it's not strictly in the, in the transit improvement program, but I do think uh, for people that have looked at this and, and kind of the potential impacts of an of a overhaul of our transit system, uh, it'd be good to have a sense of that going into it. Thank you. Yeah, we hope every last one of them gets adopted. The mayor addressed j nearly every one of them, and so it is our hope that everyone would get a, get adopted. I think, generally speaking, uh, the, the mayor does support what the the, the task force read, and and we will figure out a way to report ongoing so that updates are given out to the council and the community. So it's not just a document that sits on a shelf, but it's a living document, and you'll see progress over the course of of the time to come. Will, will that process also make clear, you know, if there are recommendations there that we decide not to pursue? Sure, sure. I mean, I think you would you would take each of them and, and talk about what what has been done or the status of each of them as we go forward. And if one drops out for some reason during the course of the next uh, period of time, we would say so. Yes, okay, great. Uh, next question is, uh, with such a significant sales tax surcharge, uh, you know, obviously we're constrained by what the Improve Act allows here, but I was curious as to why the uh, wheel tax was not included in the proposed revenue mix. It seems like ideally we'd want as broad a mix as possible, so I'd love to uh, hear more about that. Um, it was discussed, uh, and, I, and I think it's, it's fair to say um, that uh, of all of the taxes that, that we have opportunities to surcharges, it is probably the most unpopular <laughs> and hated to say the word, I guess all taxes are hated, but this one, it's a very unpopular um, uh, tax fee, whatever you want to call it. And I think it was just felt that, um, you know, uh, this we wanted broad consensus on this. And, you know, frankly, we wanted to, to try to build support rather than opposition. And we thought we would generate more opposition than we wanted to for this. I mean, is that is that a candid enough answer? I'd, I'd say that it's the heart okay. of it, yes. Uh, and then finally, this is kind of a, a companion, I guess, to Councilman Weathers' questions. Can, uh, can you help me understand how the Transit Improvement Program uh, provides, uh, you know, detail on uh, bikeways in addition to pedestrian improvements and, and just generally the compatibility with walk and bike, right? We have, you know, if I'm thinking about mobility in the city as a whole, obviously, yes, we have transit as one of those forms, but I, I know this has been presented as more than just kind of a a buses and trains plan and more of a mobility plan. So I'd love to hear more about kind of how that financial piece impacts uh, the other modes that people might use to move around the city. Go ahead, see. I think probably Jim or Mark want to touch on the broader um, pedestrian improvement program, but I, I would sort of reiterate, I think what I said in response to Councilman Withers' question that um, Yeah, and there's not, like speaking, uh, Councilman, specifically to, let's say, rapid bus as an example, or transit centers, the improvements I was talking about weren't just generic to sidewalks. It was the broader pedestrian, bicycle, the, the non-motorized um, transportation infrastructure. So, and frankly, those are things that, you know, at a transit center we develop in Bellevue, that approach may be very different than the one we do in Madison, as an example. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the you know one of one of the uh, elements in the plan for capital improvements includes the 9.5 million per per year, which is kind of a discretionary line item, and and again those improvements may or may not be directly adjacent to uh, the transit investments. So for example, we could um, improve the pedestrian facilities at intersections or schools or libraries or whatever in other parts of the county uh, that may be a little more removed from the mass transit alignments. Um, uh, it, additionally, it, it, as I had mentioned, at the park and ride lots, there would be um, adequate pedestrian facilities to allow safe passage for all modes, but specifically for pedestrians and bicycles as well as the transit stations, the bus stops, 
um, we would uh, we would do our best to ensure the safety of the pedestrians and the bicycles and create that environment where they would have striped crosswalks, pedestrian signals, um, ADA access uh, ramp, accessible ramps, you know, so they could get over the curb and onto the bus and onto the train. Um, and I appreciate that. I think I'm looking more at the infrastructure intensive stuff that we've done less of, like protected bike lanes, which we've done in a few instances around the city, that kind of thing. Just the, the more infrastructure intensive bits of this. Yeah, and, and uh, at this level of program planning, we don't, we simply don't have those details in, included in the plan. It's, it's uh, allowances at this point, and as we advance individual projects, we would introduce those details and we would vet those investments with the community and the stakeholders to make sure that, that they're in alignment with the transit infrastructure investments. Councilman Bedney. Thank you, Vice Mayor. So first of all, let me say that I'm, I'm from Buenos Aires. Uh, I was going to make a political joke, but I won't. Uh, so uh, in Buenos Aires, there is subways, there is trains, buses, cabs, Uber, Lyft, bike lanes. People don't take the bus because they're poor. They take them because it's convenient. People use it all the time. I use it. I grew up there. I will take the subway or the bus or whatever I needed. And I had a car. I lived downtown. You use it, and people will use it because there'll be a point where it will be the logical thing for people to just want to, you know, find a better way to get somewhere. So I appreciate uh, bringing this up and, and being proactive about fixing and think about the future. My question had to do, uh, it was most for Ashford about the jobs and uh, how, what type of jobs are we going to be uh, doing. We just passed this legislation, uh, you know, talking about the type of uh, jobs we want to see happen when we do an investment uh, with pilots and that sort of thing. So the, the, well, I guess I was ho hoping that you will talk a little bit about what type of jobs are we trying to talk about, like permanent jobs, uh, like high paying jobs, uh, support con the contracting, minority contractors, that sort of thing. Thank you. I don't know if that, I'm not sure if that one is working. Ashley. Can you hear me? There you go, it is. So uh, right now, five in, uh, Councilman Bedney, uh, we know that the first most immediate jobs that'll come on board will be jobs working with MTA as bus drivers and maintenance workers. Uh, so we've been working with NCAC, we've been working with uh, our nonprofit leaders such as the Urban League and others in the community to try to get individuals knowing that those jobs will be coming uh, first online. We do know that eventually there'll be more construction jobs that'll be coming online and that feeds into what we're doing with our the mayor's construction readiness program and what that looks like. I think as we continue to get uh, more data about the plan and what particular jobs in other areas of this plan comes out, we'll be able to uh, string out more training programs and opportunities uh, going forward. But we know that we are working with, uh, since we have 2.2% unemployment right now, we know that we are working with our community providers such as Project Return and other agencies to make sure that we are getting people prepared now ahead of the curve before these construction and other <laughs> uh, living wage paying jobs comes on board as well. I'm just going to uh, take a minute to just amplify a little bit um, this is just absolutely, when you're talking about this not an initiative, I know I'm preaching to the choir, this is not an initiative or a project, this is really a generational investment. When you're talking about something that is going over a 15 year period of time, there is absolutely no question but you're going to have the different categories of jobs and let me say that the one of the things that's most impressive about your work is the repeated intentionality and proactivity. I've worked at nine transit systems, four times I've been a general manager, I've been in it 40 years, and it had been through these about seven times, okay? And so you have to bring the same intentionality to the areas of workforce, which means that you will in fact know, one, there are going to be construction jobs, there is not even a question about it, and these are, I put the emphasis, good jobs, this is not just uh, 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 run around the circle, the roseberry bush. These are literally good jobs, and that's going to be going over, but we will know by critical uh, core competencies what's required, the numbers that are required, when they need to come on board, and opportunities and need for tremendous partnerships across your community. 
The other is that there is not even a question, but there will in fact the same type of skill sets in many respects that are required to build a system of this magnitude are also the same types of skills and competencies that are required to operate it, maintain it, and system preservation. And so when you, be, you start taking that real holistic look at it, there is no question, there will be an explosion in terms of, good explosion, in terms of the numbers of long-term jobs, okay, with good benefits, okay, the good jobs, that will in fact become a legacy, if you will, to an earlier point. The third is bringing real surgery to, there will be billions of dollars that are going to be being spent on component, whole new world, okay? You've got uh, major components, you've got subsystems, you've got uh, vehicles. Now, I don't want to suggest that there is a chicken in every pot, that there's going to be a manufacturing facility everywhere, however, there definitely will be final assembly. There will be detailed work that will be at the component, the subcomponent major systems. You have synergies already in terms of your automotives within the region. And on top of that, you have the opportunity to really look at this synergistically in terms of what are your potential for a manufacturing facility within the southeast, okay? Plus, you have a tremendous advanced manufacturing capability that already is foundational for you. And then when you're making, I'll be quiet, then when you're making those investments, you're also going to wind up having generation. You invest in the people, the people within these communities, they invest within the communities, and so you wind up getting that run over. So I think I'll end with simply saying this. One of the things that has been very clear from everyone is to say, we're not gonna do this on the fly, the very same precision and intentionality and, surgi and surgery, if you will, that you bring into everything will come into the workforce and the jobs piece. So that's, they've been quite clear. <laughs> Thank you. Council Lady Mina Johnson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I do have, I think, maybe a couple of three questions. Uh, first one, um, thank you for the uh, the candid tax selection uh, question. I was wondering why uh, six of uh, four tax such as option was uh, selected and why two was dumped. And so in that uh, regards, if we were to want to change uh, the financial plan in the future, uh, is it possible? And what's the mechanism is uh, to change the financing plan? That's a, a question number one. And question number two, and I would like to thank you, former uh, Mayor Purcell and Ms. Lynn for uh, taking charge of a Transit Affordability Task Force. Unlike Council Member O'Connell, I did not have a chance to finish reading 60 pages, so I would appreciate if you would uh, highlight uh, the major recommendation. And mainly, I am very interested in uh, not displacement, because in order for us to increase density and ridership, we do have a transit-oriented development, but whenever we uh, you know, promote transit-oriented development, we ended up increasing property value and you know, unintentionally ended up misplacing uh, those uh, local uh, residents. So I would like to hear more about those intentional intentionality and also related to TIF financing if that TIF financing is a part of this financing, or would it require additional financing for that portion? And lastly, and uh, for the plan, we do have a, a major corridor based on uh, in motion and uh, current uh, projected ridership. But however, if in the future, based on the, even though it will be intentional development, people may choose where they live, choose to live. So for that, there might be some density and ridership will change in the future. So our current plan will it be fluid and flexibility to reflect uh, the future pattern. Uh, those are my questions, thank you. 
have any cha any change in the tax structure or the surcharge structure would have to go through the same mechanism that we're going through now, which would require council approval and putting it on a ballot for a referendum, because the voters are voting on that uh, on those those surcharges, and, and that would stay in effect until a, some a council in the future would determine they're not the funds are no longer needed. So we, if you wanted to change it or add to it, you'd have to uh, go back through the same process. Um, the uh, subcommittee recommendations were uh, divided into five focus areas, community outreach and education, guidance on transit-oriented developments, uh, greater government alignment and resilience, funding, and public-private partnerships. You were asking for some specifics on TIF, so I'm going to ask Bill to address that. Well, as we looked at the, the TIF opportunities, you will find that there's, there's a fair amount of development of that in, in at least two sections. Uh, and I think it's worth your taking the time to look at that detail. And then Councilman, uh, as I indicated earlier, Syracuse uh, has also been looking at that, particularly as the targets as to how much of that money should go to affordable housing as to other development that may occur in the area. As we look at financing generally, we make a specific recommendation as a, as a baseline for what we think would be necessary to move forward with the overall recommendations. And with that recommendation of funding is in addition to TIF, whatever TIF may be generated. We also believe that that baseline funding will be available uh, to be leveraged with private dollars. There is no one, I think, here or anywhere, certainly on the task force, but outside either, who believes that the affordable housing uh, issue and, and truthfully in so many ways a crisis in Nashville or any major city is going to be solved by transit-oriented development or a transit plan alone. On the other hand, we believe it's a critical component of what we do going forward if we do the right things and leveraging public dollars as part of a stack of dollars uh, which will include private doctor dollars, means that, say, $100 million as a foundational amount of money would be multiplied and potentially provide up to $400 million. And on top of then would provide then tax increment financing within the regions. And then there are also the opportunities for social impact, ph philanthropic and other investment, uh, which would be both on those carters and across the city. But the, the, the core of your question, I really... Uh, would like to direct, uh, with the permission of the chair, to, to Councilmember Mendez. He, he, he led the subcommittee that, that dug in on, the, on the real, really the core issues that both you and Councilman Withers uh, are raising here, and I think, as a member of this body, was extraordinarily successful in bringing consensus around these issues. Um, thanks. Um, so the, I had the pleasure of being the, the lead for the um, Affordable uh, uh, Housing and Preservation of Neighborhoods Subcommittee on the task force, and we had a, a good representation of um, housing advocates um, on the subcommittee. And um, w one of the main things we were focused on was, was the idea that this is a 15-year plan, and coming up with um, specific numbers of units or specific numbers of dollars today for or something that's going to play out through 2032 is not really feasible. Um, and so what we, the recommendations focused a lot more on the process of making sure that we had a good viable process for dealing with displacement on a 15 year time horizon. The starting place was the idea that we know, I think nationally people recognize that transit development um, can uh, exacerbate displacement. And we want in Nashville, as we do this for transit development to be an affordable housing solution, not an affordable housing problem. This, the starting place um, was that we recommended that before any work begin on any high capacity transit corridor, that there be a very solid um, sort of pregame assessment of what is the affordable housing stock in any particular transit corridor on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. So there was a solid um, baseline to measure against going forward. Um, second recommendation was coming off of the experience of um, the, the J J Councilman Syracuse is having with Donaldson. There's been as much as 10 years of planning um, with downtown um, Donaldson in uh, having getting community consensus on what it should look like there. And um, that informed us that even if a train line is not going to start being built till 2026, um, now's the time to start the, the neighborhood planning. Um, beyond that, um, because 
although we can't today figure out exactly how many units need to be preserved and created or how much money should be spent on any particular train line, before construction begins in earnest, there must be firm fixed goals to make sure that we have a target that we're aiming for so we know how many units we're starting with, how many units we're trying to end with, um, with the end goal of by the time we get to done with the 15 years worth of construction that we fully address the affordable housing shortage in Nashville. The last set of uh, structural um, recommendations that we had on displacement was um, really to make sure that we uh, make sure the government doesn't get in the way. Um, you know, traditionally MDHA and Metro are two separate um, planning structures, and particularly as we go into this. Um, uh, new reality where MDHA is going to have um, a say on every mile of the transit corridors through the transit-oriented development districts, we have to be able to get to a place where the planning process for MDHA and Metro are um, streamlined. And you know, one, one of the pushbacks um, that we got in good faith from the housing advocate community was, um, and then uh, Councilman O'Connell last night also uh, texting me, that this is a little, maybe a little light on uh, details, um, uh, but we really, um, um, really felt that in order to do this right, we needed a current plan based on current data as these high capacity corridors go into um, effect. We're gonna need the administration um, and subsequent administrations to do a good job of following through on the recommendations to make sure that there are firm fixed goals before any um, uh, transit line construction begins. I think that pretty much covers it. Thank you. You only used three minutes of your five minutes. Council uh, Lady Allen. Oh, would you have one? Council Lady Johnson asked about, for lack of a better word, the robustness of the plan, flexibility over the long term. And that would be specifically designed in through the bus network um, issues. Obviously, that's a very flexible mode. And probably the best example, and we actually have the example up in Madison, where services that may start as mobility on demand, as that demand grows or density grows or you see the characteristic of that neighborhood change, that very easily could be converted to bus service, you know, and obviously over the long term, other options. Um, and there is money, um, there are funds baked in for that level of flexibility. Uh, in the future, including I know a number of the written questions we had were about specific route extensions in individual districts that, you know, obviously could be a consideration. Council Lady Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to pick up on the flexibility question, and, and that would be um, for the light rail in particular, a statement has been made, you know, that we're, we're building old technology. Is there enough flexibility built into the plan that as new technology gets invented or or monorails become an easier thing to build that we could adjust um, the current light rail design to be something that we we don't know exists yet. Does, do we have that option? I, I believe the simple answer is yes, we have that option with within reason. The, the plan um, describes corridors that, that demonstrate the demand and has the potential for appropriate land uses. Um, that are, are consistent with a, tra a mass transit investment. That being said, as um, technology evolves, when it comes time to prepare final design plans and order vehicles, the, propul the propulsion system may change a little bit. The way cars look and operate may change a little bit. And we would certainly adjust to those, uh, that evolution of technology and put in the most efficient, practical, uh, service available at the time. Great, thank you. And then uh, similar question, somewhere, and I know this has been analyzed to death, is there um, a, an analysis that shows the cost per mile in very general terms of uh, fixed rail versus bus service versus the tunnel versus a monorail, which again, something that, that keeps coming up and people say, why don't we build it? It might be helpful to say because it costs four times as much. Is that information available anywhere? Yeah, we, we have the summary information that is embedded in the, uh, in the transit report. improvement program. Okay. Um, the, the short answer for light rail corridor, we're coming in at about 125 million per mile, per corridor mile uh, for light rail. On rapid bus, 
We're at, uh, I believe, 8.5 million uh, per mile, and that's simply a, a budget and allocated cost uh, for those improvements that are yet to be defined on a corridor by corridor basis. And then, Steve, if you wanted to talk more about uh, local bus or uh, uh, the neighborhood transit centers. The neighborhood transit centers, um, I think in approximate unit, there was some variation because we did kind of winnow into specific neighborhoods where property values might be higher or lower. Um, so there was a real estate cost associated with that, and then there was a, a unit pricing depending on whether or not it had park and ride capacity or not. Um, but I think they were mostly in about the six to eight million dollar per unit okay. range on a construction basis, and then they were variable for uh, real estate acquisition. Thank you, that's good. And then one other thing on flexibility, and then hopefully I can get in a couple more questions. Um, we keep talking about the regional aspect of this. Do we, again, have the flexibility to extend each of these light rails to go all the way to the county line to tie in with what the other counties might do? Yeah, the flex, yeah I mean, the, it's designed for that purpose, but obviously the cost would have to be adjusted. Currently, I mean, currently they all sort of stop short, but they're all aiming that way. Is That's that correct? correct? Okay, thank you. That was that was my interpretation as well. A couple of sidewalk questions: Do we have any money for greenways? And as bridge improvements are done to make sure those are done as complete streets, um, the, the the intention of the corridor improvements would include complete street concepts. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, and for for planning level uh, analysis and, and cost estimates that we've prepared to date, we simply don't have that level of detail in the design built in. But the intent is to do a complete streets concept okay. along these corridors. Great. Thank you. And then, again, another thing that we heard the other night um, was requests for a community benefits agreement. Um, it sounds like Ashford addressed, addressed many of the items that would be in there. Can someone address how the state uh, relates to our ability to write community benefits agreements, and if that's not a possibility, how, how we can formalize all the commitments that you're making so that it essentially has the same weight that, that folks were asking for. It would be possible theoretically to have some kind of community benefits agreement. The devil is in the details. Um, as you know, state law prohibits us from having any kind of local hire requirement. Um, it, state law prohibits us from having any kind of union participation requirement. Um, so it, as long as as the, the um, benefits that are, are described are consistent with state law, then, then it, it would be possible um, for, for some kind of an agreement. And that's, that could simply be formalizing the commitments we've made to, to DBE and to, to good wages and things like that. I, that I would hope that's something that we'd be willing to do. As we develop the program, I'm sure we'll commit it to that. Yes, we do. Excellent. I think that's, I think that's important. Um, thank you. I believe that covers all my questions. I can just steal two seconds of her time to, to correct my answer to Councilman O'Connell. My communications team has advised me that my answer on the real tax should have been... <coughs> That it, it, and thinking it through is the real wheel tax is probably as regressive of a tax as there exists. Whether you have a $500 car or a $50,000 car, you pay the same. And it also, you get no benefit of out of county residents uh, helping to pay for their co portion of it. So when you balanced all that, uh, it's another um, maybe a better answer for why it was not included than with the one I gave you. Before we. <laughs> Before we move on to Councilman Elrod, who is next, I will say I have four speakers left. Um, we're, looks like we're on track to get a vote before 645, which allows everybody who would like to go to the next meeting to do that. We now have five. Um, uh, and um, so, um, great. Uh, it, um, and I know that if anybody does have questions that don't get answered tonight, everybody will be available between now and Tuesday and between now and February 6th as well. Uh, and Councilman Elrod, can you start by cleaning us up procedurally a little bit too and move approval? Mr. Vice Mayor, I move approval, uh, committee approval of the ordinance. Is there a second? second. All right, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, I just had a question um, really to, to the cost. It's been referenced in the 5.3 number or the, or the $9 billion number. And if I've watched uh, thousands of hours of HGTV for something, it's that you need contingencies. Um, 
in estimating of cost. Um, so could y'all talk about, um, uh, y'all reference the FTA formulas. If y'all could reference or talk about um, how the costs are done, I think specifically probably the biggest budget item is the tunnel. Um, it's how that is figured up and the contingencies that, that I know have been talked about um, in the plan or any kind of specific part of the plan. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, the, the cost estimates were based on the Federal Transit Administration's standard cost categories, and quite simply, that's uh, allocated costs for stations and terminals, vehicles, um, systems, guideways, uh, soft costs, contingencies, et cetera. So it's a, breakdown, a logical breakdown of costs, and it's applied that way for new start projects across the country. So we use that as a basis to develop the costs. Um, for, for the tunnels, so we followed those and we built up quantities and unit costs and assumptions where we could to, to develop the cost for the tunnel. And then we added uh, money for some risks in, in the construction of the tunnel and the construction of the underground stations themselves. Um, and in addition, because we need more, uh, we need extensive geotechnical information, hydraulic information, building foundations information before we can fine tune that design and likewise tune up those costs. Um, so we have money for risk. And then in addition, we've put a 30% construction contingency on top of the allocated costs and a 10% soft cost or professional services contingency on top of those costs as well to try and cover the risk of that type of investment. Is 30% the standard it, contingency? It, at this stage of uh, program development, it is. You get farther along in the process. So at the end of preliminary engineering, as you go into engineering and you know more about uh, the risks and the existing conditions and the specific scope of the project and the means and methods of constructing the project, you would reduce your contingency because you have, you're eliminating risk as you go forward and you have more information. Great, and this may be um, to uh, Garrett, I believe his name is, because I, th I think it's also important to highlight, you know, the cost to the city, um, but also to the cost to riders and to the sit to, you know, citizens and people that are actually traveling. What, what are some of the costs that folks are currently expending and how worse are they gonna be getting? Could you cl clarify exactly what you're talking about there, Councilman? I guess if you're, if you're a motorist today, how, how much are you losing by sitting in a car? And how much in the next 10, 15, 30 years is that going to be getting worse? Because the handout that we received, it talked about, you know, how far you can get in 15 minutes. You know, every, you know, I could get further in 15 minutes just five years ago, a lot further than I could today. You know, how much, how much more time are we going to be spending in a car if we don't have better bus service, light rail, that kind of thing? Um, and how much is that going to be costing, you know, you know, you have the, the things such as, you know, lost family time and that kind of thing, but you're, you're spending gas, uh, you're, you know, it's you know, less uh, uh, efficiency as far as, you know, moving folks in your time of day and that kind of thing. So you, can, can someone talk about that? Sure. And most of those answers are being prepared now. So I don't, I don't have the data in front of me, but it's forthcoming. Uh, Wilmot is on the team. They're preparing a triple bottom line analysis, um, and we will share that data with you as it becomes available. We're currently calculating the automobile travel time, and we're basing it on MPO data to make sure that it's quality defensible data. We're also collecting data from the MTA in terms of existing bus travel times in the high capacity corridors. Once we have that data, we can compare it to travel times on LRT LRT being more predictable travel times because it's in, in its own dedicated guideway. Then we could calculate that loss, the, the value of the lost productivity time um, and things of that nature um, and the environmental impacts and the costs associated with the environmental impacts that, that we would avoid by getting more people out of cars and onto transit. So the data is forthcoming, but that's where we're at in terms of status of that analysis. Okay, I've got several other questions that may just be for later, but I would just, I, I know it's 55 pages and it's a lot of reading, but there's a lot of good statistics in the, the, the TIP, the transit, uh, Transportation Improvement Plan, about a lot of those lost times um, and the benefits um, to this. And, and I ask council members to read it because this is an extremely important um, question that we're deciding. And I think, um, I mean, I'll be honest, I haven't read it yet. 
Um, but I'm going to be doing it before second reading next week. Um, so I'll just encourage council members uh, to do that. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Councilman Gilmore. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, first, I just wanted to thank uh, two of my favorite people who have been great public servants, the former um, mayor. We have Bill Pricera and, and our constitutional officer, Ms. Brenda Wynn, and just really thank you for your service. I really wanted to, and that, the fact that you continue on with your service. So we, we definitely appreciate that. I just had um, two things, actually. One is I had requested a, um, a map from the Planning Commission to override the legs of the transit with those areas of poverty. And so I, I'm very much uh, committed to, to transit. I've shared that with the mayor, still committed to transit. But however, I was concerned when I looked at the map, once you go north of the river, there is, there's only um, bus rapid. And I mean, there could be many ex explanations for that. It could be because the infrastructure wasn't there. You know, I don't know what's first, the chicken or the egg. But, but however, I think we really, I would like to see the, the plans on how we have on up in that infrastructure. So I saw that, so it was like two um, going, when I look at it, it was a lot of it going towards West Nashville, but it wasn't, there's one going, one leg going north, and there's two legs going down through, this has um, Berry Hill, all the way up to Berry Hill, and then the other was, so I'm not just gabbing here, it looks like Volte. And so I just wanted to kind of bring that to the uh, to your attention. Um, you might probably already know it. And just because we, when we talk about jobs and we talk about job creations, the same thing. This is going to be such a boon that I think some of the neighborhoods are going to lose out. But I mean, you know, like I said, I still support it. But it's just that I think some of those neighborhoods won't be able to benefit like others. But overall, I do think transportation is great for the city of Nashville. But I am concerned, like I said, those areas that have the highest poverty. Like so, there's a there's a leg that goes. Um, horizontal to DB Todd, but it does not go um, parallel. And so I just, that was one thing I did want to share. And this came from the last, the less moved um, Nashville census map, and they just kind of overlaid it with that. So that, that's a concern. I wanted to bring that out. And then the second piece, I think maybe the former mayor can answer if you're here on behalf of MDHA. No? Okay, ah, so we probably need to have another meeting. So the second one is, and I, and I also sent a group of questions in, and I won't rehash that, and I got about maybe 16 pages and some links back, and I want to thank um, Joseph Woodson for responding so efficiently as well. But I, I was interested in, because I, I got to read some of the, not all of it, but the, the less move transit solution um, packet there, and we talk about poverty and kind of, trying to equalize that. So I was concerned as it relates to MDHA, as it relates once again to those legs that are committed to transit, not TIF money, not partnerships, but how many, um, how much housing they were gonna de develop themselves as it relates to those areas that have been identified for legs of transit. So I wanna know, how, is, is there gonna be some going away and how much is gonna stay there? And uh, those were my two uh, questions and I would like to see that mapped out as well, so thank you. Yeah, and if we could probably have another meeting too. I mean, Freddie's good over there. He's ran all 60 pages and this and that. I haven't got to read through all of that. So I think it'd be good just to kind of have a follow up um, once we um, do this, um, have this meeting, take the vote. Thank you. Councilman Scott Davis. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, um, Mr. Our lawyer, Mr. Mr. Cooper, um, Jameson, um, um, Mr. Reebling. Few, few questions. A um, couple questions from the community. One of the things you know that we're all trying to address to make sure we're not doing is you know adding more displacement because Nashville, I love the city, favorite city, where we all live. You know. Looking at other cities and when this kind of rail happens, it's been a concern. Now, I, there may be a potential solution or, you know, I know we're working hard not to have that issue. Now, I know we can't use the funds to build certain things. Um, I know we can't, can we, and this is just for some of the people back at home, can we use the money to build affordable housing? No, sir. The, uh, the the transit the, the funds generated 
from the surcharge on the from the transit program have to be dedicated to transit related issues. That's state law. Now my next question is now since this is going referendum, could we do a separate referendum to allow money to go into affordable housing? Not, I mean, the improved, not, not using the Improve Act referendum. I mean, the council has the authority to raise, generate, raise taxes, fees, surcharges, whatever, you know, that it has the legal authority to. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> but obviously, it can only do that on what it's, what the legislature has given it the authority to, to, to tax. You can't impose a tax that you have no authority from the legislature to do. Gotcha. But if you wanted to take one of the existing taxes and do some dedicated funding for something, then that is permissible. And would you provide any suggestions at a future date on where we could use some of that money? Well, I, I would, I would, you know, point out that we have already uh, by putting, you know, putting more money into the Barnes Fund, uh, put you putting some money into general obligation bonds. That's probably the vehicle that we would, you know, off the top of my head, would recommend a continued emphasis on that going forward. Uh, mayor's committed to. Uh, affordable housing, one of the reasons why we created the task force chaired by our uh, elected officials, former elected officials, is to make sure the public felt and knew at the outset of this vote and this effort that we were committed to these issues uh, and that it wasn't just, um, you know, something we're going to deal with in the past but have some concrete recommend recommendations today that would guide us going forward. So I think together we can make this happen. We just got to continue to work together as we have in the past. Gotcha. Now, we'll go. I'm not done yet, sir. <laughs> a few more questions from you know our phones, our friends back at home. Now, <clears throat> since answering those questions, now a lot of this is going towards infrastructure, obviously. Okay. Now I know we cannot use that money for you know for to build for affordable housing from this. You've answered that question, and I think the legal team has answered it also. Now. Can we use it to improve not just infrastructure for transit? Can we use it to improve water infrastructure and also maybe some infrastructure, you know, which will make it easier on those corridors to build affordable housing? Because most of the time, a lot of the cost in dealing with um, building housing and making it affordable is you've got your water issues that have to be addressed and your sidewalk issues that you have to address. Is there a way that we can use? Because infrastructure improvements are important all around. And I, and I, I, I don't, I, I did, would have to get into the specifics. I think clearly a sidewalk is part of a transit network. Uh, and as you, as you expand the complete streets and do the infrastructure improvements, you obviously are going to have to do some utility work in those districts too. I mean, I mean it's just kind of natural. So I would think that some utility work would be, a, would have to be part of this as part of the, the overall uh, construction. But again, it's, it has to, and, I, and I'll defer to Mr. Jamison, Mr. Cooper, it still has to relate back to a transit related purpose. Otherwise, um, I think you're going to run afoul of the act. I just have two more questions, Vice Mayor. Roll on. Okay. Um, <laughs> the last question for you, sir. Okay. Now, on those transit corridors, because how important it is, good opportunities for affordability, good opportunities for density. Now, on those transit corridors, can we waive certain things? Like if we're, if we're going down Charlotte Pike, great corridor, and let's say that, hey, you know, since we're doing this great train, and this monorail down Charlotte Pike, as it's one of the streets on, I know Gallatin's included too, right, where it may cost me $100,000 in fees to build on, on build my 25 unit um, affordable housing or workforce housing units. Can we get those fees waived because the infrastructure that's being put in from the $9 billion? I think, you know, and I, I would defer perhaps to the, the task force, but I think the whole purpose behind the transit-oriented development will be to generate, to utilize some of the taxes that are generated from the developments along those corridors and put that back to incentivize uh, and bring down the cost of, for affordable housing so affordable housing will be generated. I think if you look at historically what happens in other cities, uh, you see development <clears throat> occur along those corridors, which is going to generate new revenues, uh, some of which can be dedicated towards bringing down the cost of affordable housing. Right. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Riebling. Um, Attorney Cooper, sir. And Mr. Jamison, if you can back them up or assist, please. I'd greatly appreciate it, sir. 
<laughs> Whatever you say, I will agree with you. Okay. Go, Go ahead. Okay. Um, for, our, for, our, for our team of lawyers, okay, now, just as you said earlier, we can do a community benefits agreement <coughs> as long as we don't violate state law, correct? Correct. So we can do one as long as we don't violate state law. Right, and, and the, the um, commitments that the mayor has made regarding workforce development and things that you typically see in a community benefits agreement, I mean, that, that's what we're already talking about doing here, so yes. Okay, and last but not least, lawyers, if we wanted to along the corridors, can this body do a bill after this or before it to waive certain fees and costs to people building on these corridors? And you no, and you wouldn't want to. Okay. There's a question. Thank you. And Councilor Henderson. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I have two and a half questions. Um, uh, I guess the, the first comes uh, from my constituents uh, largely, um, and, and I share kind of their question and concern. It's just more at a, uh, uh, at a kind of philosophical level, um, the, the scale of this plan um, has kind of been, you know, go big, go home, you know, aim high, shoot the moon. Um, and with such a significant amount of light rail in the plan. And so um, just earlier you shared with us that light rail has a cost of 145 million per uh, track mile. What was, what was that amount? I didn't quite it, get. It, in, in total in capital cost $2017, you're, you're just over 4 billion for light rail. Bus has um, just short of a billion dollars, grand total per mile, if you exclude the tunnel and you exclude the operating facilities, so the surface light rail corridors, it's about 125 million per corridor mile. Okay, thank you, 125 per corridor mile, whereas I'd written down 145, I apologize. That's correct. So 125 um, per corridor mile compared to rapid bus at 8.5 million per corridor mile. So, you know, that's what, 15 times Light rail has 15 times the cost of rapid bus. And so, you know, we've seen in some cities that have really gone um, uh, kind of bus heavy on their focus. And, and I do appreciate that the Let's Move plan mm -hmm. is kind of front loaded with a lot of great improvements to our bus infrastructure. So I, I think that is commendable. Um, but, you know, if you look at cities like Seattle, right, that had a successful uh, referendum just shy of a million dollars, um, it was very, like, bus-focused. So, you know, in the last six years, Seattle added 45,000 new workers in downtown. 47% of those take transit. Ridership is up 4% in 2016. And so now one in five or 20% of all um, uh, workers in Seattle take the bus to work. Um, and that's, that is pretty remarkable. So I'm just asking kind of from a philosophical standpoint, I mean, if, if I had my druthers, right, let's just say this, say this were a council plan. Um, it, in my view, it might be a $2.5 billion plan and it's just all kinds of rapid bus and maybe one corridor of light rail and such that, you know, the community could see um, the implementation of light rail, what does that mean for those businesses in that particular corridor? What were the cost overruns? Build the community confidence in that one somewhat of a pilot corridor for light rail. And, um, you know, and then kind of go big, go home on bus because from a return on investment, um, you know, in, in my view, I think we've seen many cities now that if, if they really make their bus system excellent and exceptional, um, that they garner the same benefit, if, you know, not more um, than they would with a light rail plan. So can you first speak to um, why we chose to go big, go home with five corridors of light rail in a 15-year plan, please? I think I've been elected to uh, take this one on. Um, again, predominantly bill comes out of the end motion strategic plan of the RTA and the MTA. And many of you were at very active participants and very actively involved in that plan. And you may remember as part of that process, which was very publicly focused, 
the original rounds of public engagement and the original analytics, we basically released three scenarios to the public. We, we basically said, you know, population will grow, so maybe we increase spending on our transit system, but it'll be poor, but proportional to population growth. So there won't be any additional funding, and this is what you get. We, uh, we did the, quote, big, go big or go home version, which is essentially what's mirrored in Let's Move Nashville, and this is what you get. And then there was, you know, the Goldilocks Middle Bear version of, which was predominantly where light rail would be replaced with bus rapid transit. And frankly, the overwhelming response of the public that responded, and this was across sectors, this wasn't really dominated by a particular income group or a particular neighborhood, was for that go big or go home. I think to your question, Council Lady, probably the more controversial thing from a public reaction standpoint, it's, it's controversial no matter what would have been if we had said, we heard what you said, the overwhelming majority of you said, we want more rail, we want go bigger. If you're gonna spend, we're gonna to have to spend money, let's spend enough to have a real impact. If frankly we had come out and said, we heard what you said, but we're gonna go down. Um, I think that would have been a challenge. Understood, Mr. Bland, but I, I guess, you know, when you talk about plans conceptually, right, any member of the community, sure, I like conceptually light rail better than bus. Um, I think people, you know, travel to other cities, they ride it, it's a very nice experience. You know, historically, right, that's what we had. We had the trolleys, we had all that. We ripped all that out in all our cities in America and we put in bus, so here we are. Um, and so I guess, you know, when you pose a question to the community conceptually, do you want go big, go home, go light rail, did we likewise, I don't recall, say to the community, do you want to choose go big, go home, and light rail costs $125 million per mile and bus costs 8.5? And I think if you had put that particular question to the community, I don't think they would have chosen go big, go home. Actually, we did. In fact, um, most of the headlines surrounding the release of the in motion plan were around at that time what was based on that scope. And again, it's not apples to apples, $6 billion. So people who made that choice, and that was broken down at what would it cost the average household, um, what have you. So, you know, might people have looked at it and said, well, I'm going to look at what I get, not what I have to pay? Sure, that's possible but that information was provided for all three levels of choice uh, to the general public. Okay, I appreciate it. I appreciate you sharing Thank that because I have some constituents And who I'm happy to get you that, you know, those documents um, to show you what we had out there for those choices. Okay. And, and in fact, the breakdowns, we kept very close track of as we were getting responses or for lack of a better word, votes of what sectors, like, you know, what did Bellevue say? What did Antioch say? Um, so we have pretty good detailed information. On I appreciate that. And Vice Mayor, if I may, that was one and a half. And then if I could ask one question, please, um, brief, related brief. to the sidewalk improvements. Um, so I see here that light rail improvement includes 36 miles of sidewalk at a cost of about $7 million. Now, I understand that's a pavement cost only. Um, but if we we don't assume, but if we know a mile is 5,280 linear feet times 36 miles, that is 190,000 linear feet of sidewalk. Our walk and bike strategic plan says the cost per linear foot of sidewalk to Nashville is $599 a linear foot, and that is without right-of-way acquisition, okay? So those 36 miles of light rail associated sidewalks in our corridor by our walk and bike strategic plan cost calculations cost $114 million. And in this plan, we have $7 million designated. That is a big disparity. So even if we have 9.5 discretionary somewhere to kind of uh, get that, can, can you address that disparity? I, you know, I assume there's a likewise a, a similar cost disparity. I appreciate that there is parity between uh, the, the cost that, uh, of sidewalk that is gonna be put to the bus um, corridor enhancements as well. But when you look particularly at that light rail investment, those 36 miles, that, that is a huge disparity in my view from a cost perspective. So can someone address that? Yes, that's a, that, that's a terrific observation and, and we've made note of that ourselves. And 
when we built up the cost, we were looking at a typical section and, and then built up the cost. So we have utility relocation is separate. The curb and gutter that you may have to um, uh, modify to put in a new sidewalk that would traditionally be in a sidewalk cost, that's separate. Um, the, the boulevard where you may put in grass or have some type of excavation, fencing, et cetera, all that is, is separate costs. And so we, we extracted the actual cost of the pavement itself for discussion purposes. We would have to back into an all-inclusive cost to have anything that would Thank resemble you. an apples to apples Thank comparison you. for you. Thank you. I'm going to have to... We do have people who need to be somewhere okay. soon, so thank if, you, Council. If I may, Vice Mayor, in that regard, could could we please work on that some more? Because I mean, that's a massive disparity, and you can't build sidewalks without utility rotation, thank curb you, and gutter, Lady. et cetera. Thank, thank you, you, Vice Mayor. Councilman Swab. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. And uh, on behalf of all of us, thank all of you for spending your evening with us this evening to answer our questions in a public forum. Um, I have one question. It should be very simple. It actually should be a yes or no answer. Uh, and it plays off of what Councilmember Allen and Councilmember Davis have already alluded to. As, as we literally send a referendum to indebt this city in probably the single largest project in Nashville's history, I'm very curious as to whether or not we are locked into the plan, specifically on five light rails and a tunnel, or as we go through your your go from conceptual plan to detailed construction plan over the course of the next two to three years, can we change this plan? Or are we locked into it from the moment this referendum is voted on? Common sense would tell you that if something technology comes along, <coughs> excuse me, that says this is outdated and won't, won't work, isn't feasible, you're going to have to make some adjustments as you go. But the act requires you to put together a plan and basically how you're going to ask the plan, which is what we've done. Um, but I think there are, there would have to be some common sense provisions going into the future if, if some, you know, if uh, some technology that we don't know if about today comes into play that would say you shouldn't do this and we would have to come back to the council, future legislators, and, and make the adjustments on the, at that time. But that would have to come back to the council to change. I, I, yeah, clear, clearly, the vote. yeah, yeah. It, we couldn't, yeah, it couldn't just be done by administration. Ah, there you go, <laughs> Councillor Cooper. If it was a, you know, material change where you're just totally scrapping the whole thing and and starting over, I mean, you would have to go through this process again. Now, as Mr. Reveling said, you, th no plan is 100 percent. So there, there, and it was written in such a way to have some flexibility to allow for changes in technology and things like that. But if it's going to be a, you know, completely different concept from what was approved, then you would need to go through the process again. So for all intents and purposes, as we vote, not only tonight, but uh, next Tuesday, and as the public votes on the referendum on May 1, should we pass it through this council, we are locked into light rail and a tunnel in this plan moving forward, correct? Because if, if you take light rail and a tunnel out of the equation, that's a substantive well, then, change. Well, then, yeah, that would be a substantive. I mean, if you eliminate every light rail line, eliminate every tunnel, the tunnel, then I think you would have to go back to the voters to, to make those changes. To make those changes, yeah. Thank you. And again, thank you all for being here. Councilor Virtue, I've been moving us along just for you because I know you have to be somewhere in nine minutes. So I, now we thank you go so much, night. Vice Mayor. Mine is 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 really well, maybe simple. Um, how was the the priority of the the corridors de determined as far as um, the phase? Like I believe we're starting at at Gallatin, and I believe Murfreesboro Pike is last in the phase, and I, and I understand that it's a it's a plan, but that corridor, to my understanding, has the second highest ridership uh, in the city, if I'm correct. So just trying to understand how a corridor that has the second highest ridership in the city is considered last in the plan. Let me, I'll, I'll, let me say, excuse me. <clears throat> I think Gallatin Road was chosen first for the primary reason is it's a non-state road, uh, and it's felt that the, the ability to get the approvals for that road will be quicker than the others, and it's also a very heavily utilized 
uh, uh, utilized route. I think as it relates to the timing, uh, there had to be a, a system put into place so you could figure out when the revenue's coming in and the costs associated with it. All these routes will need state approval uh, because they're all state routes. And the timing to get those is going to change because the state's going to have questions and there's going to be issues each one. So there will be adjustments, I would think, in terms of those going forward. But in terms of having a plan, you had to lay out, um, you know, a schedule to make it work. Will that actually be the way it ends up? I doubt it. Uh, but we had to have a schedule for the plan's purpose. That is everyone who has asked a, a question because I never do it like I'm supposed to. I am going to add one thing. Uh, Mr. Riebling, uh, since the very get-go, I have complained about the fact that this is called a transit plan because I believe it is part of a transportation plan. Um, so I would like to ask uh, for a commitment from the administration that as we proceed, that we will consistently look at this as part of our multimodal transportation system and always be thinking about how we incorporate autonomous vehicles, how we incorporate uh, bicycles, how we incorporate pedestrian life into the implementation of the, the plan as we go forward. We concur. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so with that, we are going to call the roll. Uh, Mr. Jameson, uh, would you please start with Mr. Cooper? I'll call your name and ask you to vote aye or nay. Councilman Cooper. This is a motion to recommend approval of, <coughs> correct. <coughs> Council Lady Gilmore. Aye. Councilman Mendez. Aye. Council Lady Hurt. This is, for, this is to recommend to the uh, council as a whole that they vote for approval. That was the rec that was the motion by Councilman Elrod. But we're never going to do anything other than vote to put it on the ballot. That is our that is all we have the authority to do as a body. We can vote to put it on the ballot. Councilman Shulman. Aye. Councilman Hastings. Aye. Councilman Haywood. Aye. Councilman Swope. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Withers. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman, uh, Councilman Lady Van Rees. Aye. Councilman Pridemore. Aye. Councilman Pardue. Councilman Hager. Aye. Councilman Roten. Aye. Councilman Syracuse. Aye. Councilman Freeman. Yes. Councilman Sledge. Aye. Council Lady Allen. Aye. Councilman O'Connell. Council Lady Roberts. Aye. Council Lady Weiner. Council Lady Mina Johnson. Council Lady Murphy. Yes. Councilman Pulley. Councilman Elrod. Council Lady Vercher. Council Lady Karen Johnson. Councilman Bedney. Council Lady Henderson. Point of order. At this time, this is for the recommendation of the committee of the whole. I want to council. state that I, I do support this being on the ballot for referendum, for decision by our constituents. But I think from a committee standpoint at this juncture, related to my concerns about the plan, seeing that my vote does not necessarily keep this from advancing, um, I, I am a no vote uh, today. That Thank does not mean I'm a no vote Thank in the end. Thank, Thank you. you. That concludes the roll. Yo, yo entendi. That concludes the roll. Support. That concludes the roll. Um, the bo vote has not yet been reported. You may change your vote. Are you changing your vote or you're just asking if you can? You are changing your vote? To, to yes. Council, Council Lady Hurt changes her vote to yes. Okay. Motion passes. Motion, pa motion carries. Uh, anybody interested in the actual count? 
can get it a uh, copy of this from Mr. Jameson. No other business being properly before the council. This meeting is adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.